This is an important idea on how to keep training a large language model indefinitely, which would be continually adding new data and training the model forever. That could probably be done on a weekly basis, for example, to pre-train, continue pre-training the model on the new data acquired the last week, the newest data. One problem with that right now is the learning rate decay. So prerequisite for this video is for you to understand and know what learning rate is in neural networks and machine learning. So learning rate is going to be multiplied with gradients to update weights. And there are two main ways, two popular ways to do learning rates uh, these days. So we have cosine decay, which we start here on this graph with a, a small learning rate. In the beginning of the training, we quickly ramp it up. And then as the training goes, as steps progress, we kind of reduce the learning rate. And I will explain why. And the second one is warm up stable decay. And this warm up stable decay is maybe even getting popular uh, lately even more. I will explain this learning rate. The first issue here is that you see that uh, it starts decaying and then when we finish the training it goes very low so let's say you want to add new data now where should you return the learning rate to should it be up here should it be somewhere here or should it be somewhere on this if you're using cosine uh, decay so the idea this paper proposes is actually not to decay learning rate at all and replace the functionality of the decay with some other trick so let's first discuss functionality of these, all of the parts of the learning rate, why there is warm up, why there is decay or stable and why, yeah. So why is there warm up in the beginning? Why is it uh, starting slow or low and then rising rapidly? In the beginning, you are initializing model weights randomly. And because of that, loss could be huge. So in the beginning, a neural network doesn't know at all how to perform your task. So the error, the loss will be huge. Here, if you have our prediction minus the ground truth, whatever the values are, it can be huge. And then because it's also squared, so that this square is making loss very big. Let's uh, see two examples. If we take that let's say weight is zero ground truth is two so here loss is four and if we just look at this don't look at the gradient yet and here if the weight is zero and ground truth is 10 the loss is even bigger and in the beginning in the beginning there will be massive difference between the our weights our weight times input and the ground truth massive difference and when loss is big or bigger, gradient will also be a lot bigger. And so let's see how we calculate gradient. Gradient, so how do we, when we change weights, how does loss change? So we will know then how to change weights to make, because we, we know that we want to make loss go down towards zero. And so this is how we need to change weights subtract this from weights depending on if this minus is included or not included or but you would need to have like this huge number so weights minus this huge number big numbers are generally not good in neural networks because you make huge jumps imagine you are standing somewhere on this loss surface and because the loss will be very big you will be standing somewhere high on the surface but uh, when you calculate big gradient because the loss is big and it's gonna make you take a very big step so you might actually skip the valley the low point and actually go to some of the even higher places on the hill so we don't like big steps so when we have this big loss in the beginning we want to uh, reduce we want to multiply it with even smaller learning rate so we don't make huge steps because we don't know the uh, curvature the surface of the loss landscape also if you are using some optimizers like adam that are using running average that are looking at the past gradients where they are moving so the way it works the idea is 
if all of the past gradients are moving this direction and then suddenly one gradient wants to go this way then we actually don't want to go this way so much because that might be some fluke so the past direction we're gonna push it kind of this way a little bit because we also look at past directions but in the beginning you don't have any or so many of these past directions so it's not they are not like kind of regulating each other in the averaging kind of way so you want to also make even smaller steps because they're going to be a bit more random but model will learn very quickly in the beginning so that's why you can ramp up learning rate very quickly it's enough to have it just a bit in the beginning because you will see that in your training the loss will go down very quickly in the beginning the model will, will get a lot better very quickly and then it's gonna uh, start to slowly becoming become better and better and then this idea of high learning rate for some part and then slowly decaying to becoming small so in each of these learning rates schedulers you see the idea is same keep it higher and then go down and this is also keeping it higher and then slowly going down just the difference is uh, like how and when it's going down so at these parts where the learning rate is higher uh, that's where the most uh, learning is happening and it also lasts for longer period of the training this is where the main learning happens and you need to carefully adjust your learning rate based on your optimizer batch size etc for example muon optimizer would need like 10 times higher learning rate than adam w and also muon optimizer is less sensitive to learning rate so even if you like uh, make it a bit bigger a bit smaller you will in either case you will get good result but in Atan w you can't really make it a bit bigger a bit smaller too much because then it will perform worse those are my experiments that i found i'm just throwing this in there is maybe somewhat of a good analogy on why we need uh, this decaying learning rate imagine we are rolling the ball down the hill and it's gonna get momentum and then since there will be another hill in loss in your loss function the ball might actually start climbing up the hill because it has so much momentum so the idea here is to reduce the momentum of the gradient updates either for optimizers that are using like past momentum and to kind of let the model not update weights so much because now it has learned so here we presume it has already learned most of the things it needs to learn so we don't want it to start changing itself too much this is just like refining itself giving it a bit of power to change itself but not too much because it's already good also imagine that every batch of data or mini batch will give a bit different directions diff of the gradient so one will say this is the best direction to move in to minimize loss and the other will say no 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 this is the best direction so uh, when we make learning rate smaller it's kind of serving as an average because it will move just a bit here and then a bit in this direction it will not move like so much but the main reason is that model has already learned and we don't want too big updates anymore as i said the problem with the decay phase is once you train the model at the end your learning rate is low so how do you continue training the model do you return it back somewhere here or at the top here so this new paper from two months ago introduced a solution so we completely remove the decay phase we don't decay at all i forgot to say that in the decay phase it's also difficult to know which one to which type of decay to use you need to test a lot of late try different ones and so they will replace the decay phase with merge phase so they will average out a few last checkpoints to simulate this averaging that i was explaining about that decay does just like i explained that the decaying smaller learning rate will make all of the gradients a lot smaller so updates a lot smaller is like averaging a bunch of updates so averaging checkpoints will replace that and the advantage is you don't need to now calculate decay when the decay is uh, before the training and then you can easily just continue training from this high learning rate that remains high as you wish and you can simulate many different uh, learning rate decays with this method of averaging and you can use whichever you want and they also found that it just produces even better models it's not just replacement 
For example, you can merge 16 last 16 checkpoints that are saved every 25 billion tokens, which is in total 400 billion tokens of averaged out merged averaged out gradients. And merging more and more previous checkpoints uh, leads to better performance up to some diminishing returns point. And so here, merging 20 last checkpoints, each being a 25 billion token interval, leads to very good performance. 16 here, accuracy goes up. And it looks like here there is a bit of diminishing returns. Because 12 at this point performs even better and then four sometimes even overtakes. And so these show the three different merging strategies. The first one I showed you is uh, averaging or mean merging strategy. So you just take last n checkpoints and average their weights. And that's gonna be your latest checkpoint. So each of the checkpoints will have equal contribution to the merged final checkpoint. It's like a linear decay uh, re learning rate. Then inverse square root merging strategy will give more weight to the later checkpoints. So later checkpoints will influence more, they will be present more, while the earlier checkpoints will be present less in the final checkpoint. It's like multiplying the earlier checkpoints with some smaller number and multiplying later checkpoints with bigger and bigger numbers and then adding them together. So the later checkpoints will have like just a uh, stronger presence. And in both of these uh, higher uh, number of checkpoints merged lead to higher performance. Also this one achieves highest performance out of all three of these. And then exponential moving average merging strategy where weight assigned to each of the checkpoints decays exponentially with its age. So what that means is the older the checkpoint in this window of six, last 16, for example, checkpoints, the older it will be multiplied with exponentially a, a smaller and smaller number and then be added. So then the latest checkpoints carry a lot more weight. And it turns out that exponential moving average is just emulating less effective learning rate decay. So this inverse square root is best out of these three. That's gonna be it for this video and see you in the next one. I make a lot of these videos on YouTube about AI research engineering so you can check them on my channel.